Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to give just a couple minutes for folks to, to log on and we will get started here in just a moment. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and thank you for joining in spirit today on this beautiful Thursday afternoon for our lung health webinar, Every Breath You Take. I'm Michelle Marshall. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Oncology Services here at Inspira and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items that I need to go over with you. Uh, first of all, just to note that this presentation is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you might have regarding a medical condition. Now, regarding our virtual format, you may know this already, but we cannot see or hear you. The only audio and video that's turned on right now is by our panelists, myself and Dr. Shag. That being said, we wanna make this interactive and we encourage you to participate by asking questions. On your screen, you should see a box labeled Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will address as many as possible at the end. Your questions will only be visible to our panelists and you can keep your identity anonymous if you'd like. Please check the box that says anonymous before you submit your question if you prefer that it not be associated with your name. Throughout the presentation, you'll see poll questions pop up on your screen. All of the questions will be multiple choice and we encourage you to participate. It's what makes it fun, keeps it interesting. Finally, you'll receive an email after this presentation that has a recording of the webinar so you'll be able to refer back to it for future reference. So with those details out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. The purpose of today's program is to provide an overview of lung cancer risk factors, screening procedures, and what Inspira can offer to you should you be diagnosed with lung cancer. You can see the specific topics that we'll cover here on the slide. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Charles Shea, who will be handling our presentation. Dr. Shea is a board certified thoracic surgeon and the medical director of the Lung Cancer Program at Inspira. Joining Inspira is a return to the Northeast for him. Dr. Shea received his medical degree from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He completed his general surgery residency at Lankanau Medical Center in Wynwood, PA, and his fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. Most recently, Dr. Shea was an attending surgeon affiliated with the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Shea has a particular interest in increasing lung cancer cure rates through enhanced access to screening and image-guided diagnostic procedures. He specializes in minimally invasive procedures for lung cancer, and we're thrilled to have him as part of our Inspira lung cancer team. Before I turn it over to Dr. Shea, though, I'd like to lead with just a couple statistics. According to the American Cancer Society, lung cancer is the second most common cancer in the U.S., with over 230,000 cases diagnosed every year. That's about 14% of the total cancer cases that we see each year in the US. And in New Jersey specifically, there are more than 6,000 lung cancer cases diagnosed every year. That's nearly double our, our incidence rate in our region here in the South is nearly double that of the state. So lung cancer is a very real problem for our community. And Inspira is committed to treating, not only treating patients who have been diagnosed with lung cancer, but to empowering our friends and neighbors with tools for prevention and early detection. Bringing technology and programs to the community to diagnose early when lung cancer is most treatable. So let's try one of those poll questions that I talked about and start off with those. Everyone knows there's a link between cancer and smoking, but lung cancer can impact non-smokers as well. What percentage of total lung cancer cases are found in people who have never smoked? 
Go ahead and take a minute to submit your answers. All right. So it looks like our leading number here is about 10%. That's the, what, 43% of our respondents have, uh, have come in, in with a few saying 25, a few 50. So why don't I let, uh, turn this over to Dr. Shea and he can address the answer to this question and give us an overview of lung cancer and its risk factors. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, to do this webinar for your lung health. I think that by now, just about everyone knows that cigarettes are the main cause of um, lung cancer. But did you know that just about anyone can get lung cancer? Kind of going back to the poll question, now while close to 90% of lung cancer cases can be attrib attributed to smoking, 10 to 15 of new lung cancer cases are among never smokers. So the majority of you guys, the many of you guys got it right. Besides smoking, there are other factors that we need to consider, environmental factors. Around this area, we're looking like at glass factories and agriculture. It's actually been found that in occupations such as glass making, the inhalation of this thing called silica dust, naturally found in sand, has actually been found to lead to a condition called silicosis, where basically the sand, the dust particles, settle in the lung, scar the lung, cause inflammation, and over time, affects the ability of, of the lung to function properly. And patients start getting, for example, shortness of breath over time. And this condition, silicosis, has actually been found to be linked to lung cancer. So that's certainly an example of an environmental factor. There are other uh, env environmental factors as well. Uh, many of us know about these radon detectors in houses. Radon is basically a, an odorless gas that occurs naturally in the sand, in the soil, and rock. That's why those are typically, detectors are typically found in, uh, around the basements. The detectors are there because radon gas has actually been linked to lung cancer and actually accounts for almost 10% of lung cancer cases. The exposure to radon actually has been estimated to be the second leading cause of lung cancer after cigarette smoking. Almost 21,000 lung cancer deaths each year are linked to exposure to radon gas. Uh, family history is actually also very important. They have done it, epidemiological studies that shows that genetic disp disposition definitely plays an important role. As people with an immediate family member, for example, a brother, sister, mother, or father, it's found that people with an immediate family member, they have a two to three fold increase in their risk of developing lung cancer compared to people uh, who don't have it family members um, with lung cancer. And uh, well, let's finally, let's, let's talk about the role of smoking in lung cancer. Many of us wonder about how does cigarette smoking lead to lung cancer? Basically, smoke is full of cancer-causing substances called carcinogens. Some of those things that you may have heard are tar, formaldehyde in cigarette smoke. And these things like carcinogens cause DNA damage to the cells in the lung. Now, the body is able to repair any damage caused by these, um, uh, by tar, for example, but with repeat exposure, for example, someone who smokes for, for a number of years, and also the inflammation just from the exposure to this, these carcinogens, eventually mutations or changes in, in one's DNA develop and these are those are the things that mutations that ultimately can lead to lung cancer. Now kind of going over some of the stats about lung cancer and they're really sobering. One in 16 people in the US will be diagnosed with lung cancer in their lifetime. There are over 228,000 people in the US this year will be diagnosed with lung cancer. 
And that runs to about, about a new diagnosis every, every two minutes, 2.3 minutes or so. Wow, that's a really, uh, a really significant number um, in terms of the, of the prevalence. Let's do another quick poll here and see, since you guys did so well on the first one, let's see if you can carry a, continue that forward. We know that lung cancer accounts for about 14% of the total cancer cases in the US, but what percentage of all cancer deaths are attributable to lung cancer? Take a moment and answer there on your screen. All right, just a couple more seconds. Why don't we close that out? Let's see how you, let's see what you think. All right, Dr. Shea, you wanna comment on that? Looks like the, yeah. the going number is yeah. 40%. Are they right, are they wrong? You know, you know, close, close for sure. You know, lung cancer definitely punches well above its weight in terms of causing death. You know, in terms of the new cancer diagnosis, lung cancer accounts for only about 13%, so definitely a minority. But in terms of death from lung cancer, we're looking at almost a quarter, almost 25% of lung cancer death. So it's almost double the death that you would expect um, from, from lung cancer. So definitely something that's definitely a disease that's very lethal. So lung cancer, it is the leading cause of cancer death, really regardless of any gender, ethnicity, and kills 154,000 American lives every year. In fact, there are more lives lost to lung cancer than colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer combined. And the prognosis generally, as many of you know, is really not good. Um, at five years after diagnosis, only about 20% of people survive to five years or more. So, but the, but the good news is that if lung cancer is caught before it starts spreading, goes through lymph nodes or other organs, the, the survival actually can be improved dramatically. And we'll get to that um, at a, later in this talk. So those stats are definitely sobering and, and staggering, but I did hear some good news in that slide, despite the, uh, the mortality statistics. And that really comes back to the fact that a lot of the risks for lung cancer are controllable. We talk about environmental factors, and smoking, and those are things that, that we can control, which is encouraging. It allows people to, to take action for their health. And cancer screenings are often one way that people can be proactive in managing their health. Until recently, there hadn't been a screening test for lung cancer, but that changed about six years ago when low-dose CT screening came uh, into the market and was approved as an essential service that essentially opened the door for insurance coverage of testing and allowing high-risk individuals access to this potentially life-saving screening. And as you said, early detection is particularly important in lung cancer where odds of survival change dramatically depending on when you catch the, the cancer. So can you talk to us a little bit more about lung cancer screening and how it's really been a game, ch game changer in our treatment of lung cancer? Yeah, the, um, the statistics of lung cancer survival with screening, it really, it really is quite remarkable. They have found that those patients who are caught early, found early, in the early stage, very early stage of lung cancer, at five years, their, their survival is up to 80% or more. Now contrast that with someone, with patients who are found in late, later stages, the late stages of lung cancer. Their survival of five years is about, in the single digits, about 5%. Looking between 80%, 5%, that really is a huge difference. And that really, really begs that we need to find a better way to catch these um, patients early on in, this, in their stage of lung cancer. And even to this day and age, with all the treatments available, unfortunately, still the majority of people with lung cancer are found in the later stages. And of which, as I just mentioned, uh, the prognosis is unfortunately very poor. Therefore, what we need to do is get better at finding and treating lung cancer in the very early stages. And one way to do this is actually through lung cancer screening with CAT scans. 
They have done a, a recent study of over 50,000 people in this country at an, uh, multiple medical centers. And they, what they found was that people, when we do CAT scan screening for lung cancer, is actually improved the survival. It's, and primarily the survival was due to the detection of lung cancer in the very early stage, especially stage one lung cancer. So you may ask, so what are the criteria for lung cancer screening? And one of them is you need to be between the ages of 55 and 77. No signs or symptoms of lung cancer. And we'll get to, get to the signs and symptoms um, at a later slide. You must have had a tobacco smoking history of, a, of at least 30 pack years. 30 pack years, basically, if you smoke one pack a day for 30 years, or well, another way to put it, if you smoke two packs a day for 15 years, 15 times two equals 30. And you must be a current smoker, or if you quit, you must have quit within the last 15 years. This is really a remarkable technology that allows our patients to be much more proactive in monitoring their health. And I should just note that Inspira is able to provide low dose lung cancer CTs at seven of our imaging centers throughout the community. So we're really committed to ensuring access to this screening for the residents of South Jersey. But screening's not the only way we find lung cancer or lung problems. Even when patients don't have symptoms, we may find possible areas of concern incidentally or as part of other imaging studies. Can you tell us a little bit about these types of findings that are often called incidental lung nodules? Yeah, you know, lung nodules, what are they? They're basically small masses in the lungs or single mass in the lungs. They are often what, we, what people refer to as a, say, a spot on the lungs. These lung nodules are really very common and usually benign. I mean, people have found that um, at age 50, over 50% 50 of people at age 50 have some nodules, you know, one or a few. And over 95% of those nodules are benign, they're not cancer. These lung nodules are most often found when your doctor gets a test, say an x-ray, for something else. For example, if you get a, a bad flu or really bad cold, a respiratory infection, and your family doctor gets a chest x-ray, obviously your family doctor is not looking for lung cancer, but if he finds a spot, then that's considered a, a lung nodule, an incidental finding, incidental lung nodule. And the good news, typically, um, these lung nodules do not cause any symptoms. So what if you, if they find one, what are the next steps for patients who are now learned that they have a lung nodule? Yeah, and you know, as I just mentioned, because the, the vast majority of lung nodules are not cancer, obviously we don't want to you know, take all these patients, subject people to unnecessary uh, treatments, procedures, biopsy, whatever have you, but at the same time, we cannot let that small percentage of uh, nodules that are cancer, we cannot let those fall through the cracks. So what doctors do is they look at these nodules and look at the particular characteristics of the nodules that make it more likely that they're cancer. One is size. In general, the, the larger it is, the more likely it is cancer. Generally around three quarters of an inch, if it's in, anything bigger than that, that's when you start worrying about, these, um, about cancer. Another is the type of nodule. What shape is it? Is it a smooth, does it have smooth borders? Or does it have irregular uh, jagged borders? What, what doctors call speculated. And those irregular ones are the ones where you certainly need to consider investigation, um, either biopsy or, or at least very close for, uh, observation. Are those nodules, is it single or are they scattered all over the lungs? And um, just as importantly, are these nodules in what's called a low risk or is a high risk patient? An example of a low risk patient would be someone, say someone in their 20s, 30s, or even 40s with uh, no history of smoking, completely healthy. A high risk patient, 
probably someone who's in their 60s, 70s, and smoked all their life. And for those nodules where, where the risk in, is falls in between, you certainly do not want to, like I said, you don't want to start doing biopsies, but at the same time, you don't want to just let them go and, uh, um, and potentially problems can arise. So for these nodules where the risk is in between, your doctors may often watch it or what we call surveillance. And in Spira, we have long nodule clinic where we very closely watch these nodules and make sure that they don't change, such as getting bigger, change the, uh, become more irregular, for example. And these nodules can also be followed by your primary care physician, PCP, a lung doctor, pulmonologist, or a thoracic surgeon. So screening and, and incidental nodules are typically found when patients are presenting with no symptoms, but sometimes patients do have symptoms. So can you give us a, an overview of the signs and symptoms that should not be ignored? Absolutely. The most common uh, signs and symptoms of lung cancer, and especially in the later stages, include things like cough. And we're not talking about cough where you get cough from a cold or a flu. We're talking about basic persistent cough, that, that cough that just doesn't go away. That's worsening when you're coughing on blood. Uh, chest symptoms like shortness of breath or when you get new wheezing when you breathe. And also pain, pain in the chest, pain in the upper back that doesn't seem to go away with, for example, Motrin and pain uh, in the chest when you take a deep breath. Those are certainly things that you want to be concerned about and talk to your doctor. Other things include unexplained weight loss. And basically, unexplained weight loss means that it's not like you're trying to, trying to diet, but the weight just seems to fall off without any explanation. When you're having trouble swallowing, or if you're feeling just fatigued, with even though you may have slept for a good seven, eight hours the night before, but just keeps on, you just not feeling yourself. The unfortunate thing with, with these symptoms is that they're what's what we call nonspecific, that these symptoms are also the symptoms of many other diseases, some of them everyday diseases. So it's important to your doc to talk to your doctor if you have these symptoms, and especially if you're currently smoking or have a history of smoking. So what happens if you find a nodule, either incidentally or through screening or through a diagnostic test due to something due to your symptoms, and it's suspicious? What are the next steps to that? Can you tell us a little bit about how advanced diagnostics uh, come into play and, and enable our physicians to test and monitor these? Yes, absolutely. As Inspira, we offer advanced techniques and technologies that allow us to diagnose problems very often without having to make any surgical incisions, any cuts on the skin. One example is the technique called bronchoscopy. Basically, the patient is completely asleep, and the doctor places camera down the airways, down the windpipe, and look for any suspicious lesions. And if there is, and take a biopsy and send it to make sure that it is, for example, not lung cancer. Another variant of this that's being offered here is what's called endobronchial ultrasound guided corneal biopsy, or EBUS for short. Basically, what this uh, tool does is that the, also the patient's completely asleep, and this camera goes down, down, down the throat, patient's asleep. And it allows doctors to be able to find lesions that may not be readily, readily available visually. As you can see on the lower diagram, there's an ultrasound probe at the end of that that allows basically the doctor to see for any, look for any lesions that may, that's underneath in the, in the substance that's, that they cannot easily see. And when they can see that lesion, there's also a needle at the tip of it, as, it, as you can see in diagram B that biopsy gets a sample of it at the same time. Next slide, please. And a third piece to the minimally invasive program at Inspira is what's called electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. And here, this tool 
uses electromagnetic technology to find where a lung lesion is and directs tools from the doctor that the doctor uses to get to the lesion in real time. What happens is that the patient gets a CAT scan beforehand. And, and then using the, this uh, prior CAT scan, this information is fed to a computer and that computer generates actually a three-dimensional, a 3D map of the entire chest, of the lungs and the airways. And the computer actually calculates a virtual pathway, a roadmap, if you will, that basically targets this lesion. And all the doctor at that point needs to do is kind of just follow this, follow this pathway. They're very much like, like a GPS, where you basically direct a, dri a driver where to go. There, directs the doctor of where to go to. And this diagram on the, on the left-hand side, those are the CAT scans of a patient. And what the computer did was take all those CAT scans and created this three-dimensional image that you can see uh, in the center. And the green dot uh, basically is the lesion of interest, for example, lung cancer. And the computer creates this 3D image and on the bottom of the, of the middle image, the doctor simply puts his camera with a needle at the tip of it and goes right down the airways into that, uh, towards that lesion. It really is very neat. Everything is done in real time. So your doctor knows exactly where he's gonna go um, with the biopsy needle at any given time. It's really amazing how our technology continues to evolve and allows us more and more insight into identifying and treating disease. And while these diagnostic procedures may reveal benign results or results that aren't cancer, sometimes they will find cancer. And should you ever find yourself hearing those words, the, the good news I think for you is that we're here for you with cutting edge technology, treatment options, and a dedicated team of healthcare providers that we call a multidisciplinary team. We're here to create a customized treatment plan that's tailored to you and your cancer needs. So if we talk a little bit about the lung cancer treatment process and our team approach, I just talked about multidisciplinary care and our physicians all meet regularly in what we call a tumor board, where they discuss the clinical details of new cancer cases and they work collaboratively to determine the most appropriate treatment plans. So our team includes not only our highly trained physicians, our surgeons, medical and radiation oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists, but nurses, navigators, social worker, nutrition specialists, and many others who support these, our patients every step of the way. Dr. Shea is going to talk to us a little bit more now about the treatment options, and your physician will determine which treatment or combination of treatments is right for you based on the nature of your cancer. But Dr. Shea, as we start to think about treatment options, do you want to start with surgery and talk to us about some of those options from a surgical perspective? Yes, absolutely. For anyone with a diagnosis of lung cancer, you must first talk with your doctor. First about what type of lung cancer it is and what stage of lung cancer it is and what treatment options are available. And for those who are eligible, surgery consists of basically two main approaches. One is what's called thoracotomy. As you can see on the, in the uh, diagram on the left, a basically an incision along the, in, along the chest. The other, other approach is what's called video assisted slash robotic assisted thoracoscopic surgery, where your surgeon makes small incisions on the chest and using cameras and instruments, dissect and remove the lung cancer that way. And let me, I'll get to that in, in a later slide. First, the, the type, the, the main types of uh, lung cancer surgery. Here's a schematic of the most commonly done. The lung consists actually of actually several parts on each side in what we call lobes, L-O-B-E-S. On the right side, there is a right upper, a right middle and right lower lobe, three parts. On the left, there is a left upper and a left lower, two parts. You can think of these lobes as, of the lung as kind of a peels of an orange. Now they're sitting together, but they can actually, they're actually separate pieces that can be peeled apart, taken apart. If you focus on the diagram on the left-hand side, where that, that, where that marker says cancer and that yellow indicates that, 
is basically a small lung cancer that is at the periphery or at the edge of the, of the lung. In that case, what your surgeon will be able to do is perform what's called a wedge resection. Just cut out that small part with the cancer along with the small amount of lung around it. As you can see, lung, as it says, lung tissue removed. It's just a small piece. Now on the diagram on the right-hand side, the yellow um, indicating the cancer clearly is a, it is a much larger cancer. So in that case, obviously, you cannot just take a small wedge of, tissue, of lung tissue at the edge. In that case, the, your surgeon will need to take the entire lobe, that part right upper lobe out, that entire thing out, in order to make sure that there's no cancer left behind. As you can see that with the lobe removed, the entire um, um, cancer is removed and is, um, together. Next slide, please. And the main approaches to uh, cutting out lung cancer, as I mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago, are what's called, number one is open thoracotomy, where your surgeon makes a large, relatively large incision on, on the chest. And then using instruments called retractors, then the retractors put, are placed and they, they spread the ribs and your surgeon removes the cancer that way. Another approach, the video assisted, as I mentioned, slash robotic assisted, is when your surgeon at the bottom part of the left diagram, there's, the surgeon puts in a camera and, the, and basically projects an image on the video screen. And then using small incisions and specialized instruments, your surgeon may then dissect out the cancer using these smaller incisions and it's removed that way. And here at Inspira, we offer advanced techniques for removal of lung cancers with a minimally invasive approach. Basically what we do is we make tiny quarter inch incisions and through these small incisions, we use lung instruments and camera to cut out the cancer instead of a large rib spread incision. And this minimally invasive approach has been time and time again proven to be much better in terms of patient experience, in terms of pain control, in terms of reduction of time spent at a hospital, and generally much shorter recovery even after going home. And robotic assisted is another variation of the minimally invasive technique that's being offered. Now, other than surgery, depending again on the stage and the type of lung cancer, other treatment methods are also available, such as radiation to kill cancer cells. And in Spira, multiple modes of radiation therapy are, are used. In what's called external beam radiation therapy, EBRT for short, the dose, the radiation dose is what's called dose fractionated, where the total amount of radiation is given over a period of many days. Another modality used here is what's called stereotactic body therapy. It's a technique where the, uh, full, the total amount, the full amount of radiation is given in one or a very small number of treatment fractions. Each of these modalities is indicated for different conditions. So ask your doctor about these options. And this really is a very exciting time for lung cancer treatment. We are hearing about new developments for the treatment of lung cancer all the time, especially in the, in the area of immunotherapy. Many of you may have heard about some of these brand names on TV commercials, things like Keytruda or um, Optivo. You may ask, so what's the difference between chemo uh, and immunotherapy? Chemo is basically, it's a treatment with drugs that kills rapidly dividing cells in the body. And cancer being basically cells that are rapidly dividing, so it targets the cancer cells that way. Immunotherapy is a treatment that works to enhance the body's natural immune system to not only recognize, but target and eliminate cancer cells. And the paradigm has really changed so much, even in the last few years. 
for example, there are some lung cancers that, are, that used to be treated front line, first line, meaning the, um, the first approach with chemo, but now they're being treated with immunotherapy instead. And at Inspira, once a biopsy of the lung is obtained, for example, if it's proven to be lung cancer, a thorough test will be done on the tissue to make sure if these new treatments like immunotherapy can be used. These include biomarker testing to make sure to see if the patient will be a candidate for immunotherapy, as I mentioned. And Inspira has been closely involved with the most up-to-date and innovative approaches to patients' cancer care. And there are several active clinical trials ongoing right now at our leading edge cancer center and working collaboration with oncologists and radiation oncologists, pathologists, we will make sure that your cancer care is at the forefront of cutting edge technology. That was a great overview of, of treatment options. And there's definitely a lot of factors to consider in creating a treatment plan for a lung cancer patient. So I really thank you for outlining those for us. And I think it's encouraging to know that all of these options are available, available locally for patients, close to their family, close to their support network. And as we know, that type of support is really important for folks that are on their cancer journey. So let's shift gears a little bit and, and touch on a topic that is certainly top of mind for probably everyone on the line these days, and that's COVID-19. But first, a poll question. Let's see what your thoughts are on this. It's a true or false? True or false? If I have an underlying lung health issue like COPD or lung cancer, I am more likely to contract COVID-19. Take a couple seconds here and drop in your answers. All right, let's take a look at what that poll result show, shows. Okay, 68% true. So Dr. Shea, why don't you talk to us a little bit about COVID-19 and let our, let our viewers know if they're right. Yeah, you guys are good. <laughs> So the short answer, as many of you answered, um, the short answer is, is false. So you're not more likely to catch COVID-19 virus if you have underlying lung diseases. But having said that, uh, while there does not appear to be a higher risk of catching the virus with underlying medical conditions, however, there does appear to be a higher risk of complications if you were to get it. There was actually just a paper that came out just in the last couple of days out of um, University of California that looked at the conditions, um, the reports coming from Asia and Europe. And they found that smokers were at tw almost twice the um, risk of getting um, respiratory failure and, resp and complications. So that is basically an basically a way that if you have underlying medical conditions, you're unfortunately at a much higher risk of getting um, bad, bad complications from COVID-19. And how do you protect yourself? Uh, many of you have heard about this already. Stay at home as much as, you, as possible. Wash your hands often, clean, disinfect surfaces, practice social distancing, limit exposure to people who are sick or may be sick. And if you cough or sneeze, do it into your elbow, just to avoid basically getting into the air. And while you're out in public, wear a face mask. Those are helpful reminders. I think probably by this point in time, we can all probably recite them from memory. We've heard them so much recently. But it's good to know that we can take action. You can take action on COVID-19 to try to keep yourself healthy. And you can also take action for your overall lung health and take steps to reduce your risk of lung cancer. So let's transition and have a little bit of discussion about that. What are some practical things that folks can do to reduce their risk? Yeah, and many of you have heard this, but you know, just to reiterate, because you always maintain a healthy diet, healthy weight, exercise regularly, make sure your radon detector works, test for radon, be aware of the environment, avoid carcinogens, avoid secondhand smoke, and of course, don't smoke, if you never smoke, don't start any smoke, quit now. It really is the number one best thing you can do for your lung health. 
So let's talk about smoking for a minute. I think it's another good place for a poll question. So here's, here's one for you folks. When you quit smoking, when you stop smoking, how long does it take for the body to begin to heal itself? 20 minutes, two hours, 24 hours, or one week? Go ahead and place your bets, as they say. All right, let's close that out and see what, what people think. So the majority of folks are saying one week, but we've got a strong contingency saying 20 minutes. And I have to say that the body's a really amazing thing. So Dr. Shea, let them know, what's the answer? Yeah, um, next slide, please. It, it really is amazing how your body reacts uh, so quickly um, if you were to stop smoking. Even after 20 minutes, your, your heart feels that, your heart rate, your blood pressure go back to normal levels. After eight hours, the levels of nicotine in, in cigarettes and this gas called carbon monoxide, the levels in your blood are reduced to more, by more than half, and your oxygen level in your body returns to normal. Now, after 12 hours, this carbon monoxide returns to completely normal levels. And because of that, your, your heart will need to pump its heart to get the oxygen to the, to the rest of your body. And after three days, your breathing should be easier. You may experience growth in your lung capacity, meaning that you're, you're able to exercise more. For example, if you were able to run only or walk only a tenth of a mile, you may be able to do you know 15% of, of a mile or a quarter of a mile. Your body will be 100% at this point free of nicotine. The one week mark, it really is a milestone. They have found that studies have shown that people who make it to this point are nine times as to be as to successfully quit for good. After two weeks, there's improved circulation of blood in your body. Your lung function at this point can increase by as much as 30%. And after one month, subjectively, there will be, you're gonna feel less shortness of breath, less coughing, and as your lungs continue to heal. And you never, never want to give up. It may take, you know, five times, 10 times, 20 times. It can take up to 30 attempts before a smoker quits for good, but, but never give up. I think that's a really important message. And I do want to just take a minute to talk about a resource that we have available to our community when you're ready to quit for the first time or the 30th time. Um, Inspira is very pleased to be able to offer our Quit Center, um, which is a program that is 100% free. It's a grant funded program, free to the public, and really based on evidence-based science um, to, to give our folks who are looking to quit the best chance of being successful. So it starts um, with one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, with a tobacco treatment specialist. We have an individualized quit plan that we'll build for you that can include nicotine replacement therapy that's been shown to be helpful with some individuals as they try to quit smoking. We move into a group counseling session and I'm very proud of our team because they very quickly, as, as COVID-19 hit, they were able to convert all of these resources into a virtual platform. So much like we're doing today, you can participate in these groups and these one-on-one -on -one sessions mm -hmm. online. So if you're ready to quit, Inspira is here for you. The phone number is on the slide, and as I said at the beginning, you will get a copy of this presentation for future reference. So we are here. Whenever you're ready, please call us. And this actually concludes the formal part of our presentation this afternoon. I'd like to thank Dr. Shea for sharing his expertise with us. And now I'd like to take some questions from the audience. I know that I've seen a few of those coming in. I'm going to just take a minute here to, to look through those. If you've got any last minute questions, still feel free to send them in using that Q&A box. And remember, just click on the anonymous button if you would prefer to stay anonymous. So let me just take a look here at some of the questions that are coming in. Um, so first question I see here, can inoperable lung cancer be treated? Um, Michelle? Yes. Can, you, can you repeat that one more time, if you don't mind? Sure. The question is, can inoperable lung cancer be treated? 
Yeah, by uh, by definition, unfortunately, inoperable uh, signifies that the cancer itself cannot be cut out without leaving any cancer behind. However, um, so and those generally are treated with a combination of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, and or radiation. But there are uh, procedures that can be done by the surgeon that will help in terms of the patient's um, basic br worker breathing subjectively. For example, if there is a lot of, um, if there is cancer in the later stages, very often the chest may fill with fluid. And what the surgeon may be able to do at that point is to drain all that fluid and make sure and place a substance in there that will allow the lung to re-expand, meaning that to, to, get, to get as far up in terms of volume as possible so that the patient may be able to take a deep breath without the fluid being there that's causing any breathing compromise. So kind of related, um, why is there such a difference in outcomes when lung cancer is found early? Well, basically, when lung cancers are found early, they're, they're typically, typically smaller lung cancers. And when, the, when they're small, the surgeon is able to go in there and cut it out. And, if, and in essence, basically remove all the, all the cancer that's in the chest. And in essence, you almost, you can call it cure of lung cancer, rather than basically giving um, uh, medications that basically fight it, but may not necessarily remove all the lung, lung cancer. Here's another one. Do inhaled steroids contribute to lung cancer? You know, many studies have looked at that. Um, and while there are some suggestions, for the most part, there is no direct association between um, inhaled steroids and the development of lung cancer. If anything, um, inflammation, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, and carcinogens, um, you know, as in cigarette smoke, they act together to create this, um, this um, environment within the lung where cancers and mutations, mutations develop and cancers can develop. So if anything, steroids, because by nature they, they calm down the inflammation, they have not been found uh, to be involved uh, in developing lung cancer at this time, for the most part. Is there a correlation between GERD and lung cancer? And if so, what symptoms might you see? Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. With GERD, basically what that means, gastroesophageal reflux disease, essentially heartburn, where the acid from the stomach um, gets regurgitated and gets into and spills into the lung tissues. Now, just from the virtue of that, the inflammation, because the gastric acid, this acid in our stomach, is almost like battery acid. It is very strong. So if you can imagine pouring battery acid on, on, on live tissue, obviously not good. So it ca definitely causes inflammation of the lung, but in, not in of itself, although it, it certainly does not help in terms of someone getting lung cancer if they're, for example, smokers. Just that combination of inflammation does not help at all. Okay. Um, here's one. Um, I have asthma and I'm overweight. Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, thyroiditis. I shouldn't try to say medical terms. Uh, bad knees. My father was a smoker, had COPD, and had asbestositis. My early years, I was exposed to secondhand smoke, but I've never smoked. I tend to get bronchitis easily. How concerned should I be about lung cancer? And this is probably a good one to say, are there specific steps that this individual could be taking to try to mitigate those risks? Yeah, that's really a good question. Uh, as, as we talked about earlier, certainly just the inhalation of smoke, whether it's you're um, smoking yourself or secondhand smoke, it cause, put, puts you at risk. And if I heard that right, the family member has uh, been exposed to asbestos. And asbestos is definitely one of those environmental um, carcinogens that has been definitively found to be linked to development of lung cancer. So, and for example, if your family member <clears throat> uh, comes home, uh, works in industries exposed to asbestos, 
those crystals even can be in their clothing. And if you were to breathe it in, it certainly would put you at a high risk as well. Now, the lung cancer screener does not specifically mention you know, secondhand smoke or someone with asbestos, almost second exposure, second exposure to asbestos, for example. However, because of um, the history of COPD and bronchitis, it certainly puts you at a higher risk. And if you were to develop any of the symptoms we mentioned earlier, such as worsening shortness of breath, uh, any, you know, for example, weight loss or a cough that does a new cough or a cough that doesn't go away, it's certainly a very good idea to talk to your family doctor or, or a pulmonologist uh, about that. And the doctor may then um, do some studies such as x-rays or CAT scans to make sure there's not anything suspicious. That's great. A um, couple questions on here about vaping, uh, whether, a, whether vaping is a safer alternative than smoking, and also if there's any connection between vaping and cancer. That's a great question. I get asked about that all the time. The, you know, when, vape, when electronic cigarettes came out, the, the good news and, and what's been touted was that it is an alternative to cigarette smoking. As we talked about uh, cigarettes, there's tar, there's more formaldehyde, there's, there's a lot of carcinogens in there. So electronic uh, cigarettes basically eliminate many of those. It's based eliminates the tar, it eliminates the formaldehyde. So it certainly puts the individual at lower risk of exposure to carcinogens. However, the flip side is that they have seen um, in, in people who vape, and many of us have heard that in the news as well, that these um, e-cigarettes can cause inflammation in the lung. I've had, um, unfortunately, seen quite a few patients in their 40s or even their 30s after a, even a short bout of vaping. And they're, they come into the hospital, sh completely short of breath, and their lungs look like those who have been smoking for 50 years. So now, w while we do not know whether um, basically e-cigarettes um, cause cancer or not, and it, for the short term, certainly patients are not exposed to uh, cigarette smoke. However, there is definitely inflammation and damage to the lungs. So e-cigarettes, unfortunately, is really um, not a great option at this point in terms of substitution. Um, not that cigarette smoking is good, of course. Should avoid both of them is what I'm hearing you say. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, neither is, is, is good for the lungs. So I have a couple questions here on lung screening. And actually, if you don't mind, I can take the first one. Um, the first one is, I meet criteria for lung screening, but I don't have insurance. Is there a way to get screened? Um, and that's a great question. Um, I'm, you know, as we're excited to have the, the coverage or the, the test available now, we certainly don't ever want to see insurance be a reason that someone who's at high risk and meets the criteria is not screened. So the short answer is yes. Um, Inspira has uh, coverage through the ScreenNJ grant to be able to provide that um, that testing for eligible patients who meet those criteria. So you can reach out to us and we will be able to help you uh, get that test scheduled as long as you're meeting the criteria. The second question, I'll, I'll see if, if you have any insights there, Dr. Shea. Do you foresee a change to any of the lung cancer screening requirements, such as the age restrictions or any of the other um, guidelines that are currently in place? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, when the study that I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, looking at how lung, lung cancer screening can save lives, the, the um, age bracket, if you will, at, um, 55, 77, is more or less arbitrary. It doesn't mean that at age 77, your risk of lung cancer goes to zero. And we still see that. So that's pro this is probably going, going to be an evolving um, area. Um, and they have found, for example, people who are, you know, you know in their in the 55, age 55 versus those who are age 77, their risk are quite different in, ter in terms of lung cancer. So while I do not see that changing anytime in the near future, 
but as more studies coming, especially a large study coming, a uh, com couple new studies coming from Europe, that age criterion limit uh, may change. And even the so-called pack, pack years of smoking, that may change as well. So, so really stay tuned in and ask your doctor if you have any questions about that, about those criteria. If the, if the mammography guidelines are any indication, same for prostate cancer, I think we will definitely see changes, perhaps often. So we'll, right, we'll, we'll right. keep an eye on those. Ever evolve, it could be ever evolving for you. So I have a question here um, with some specifics, but uh, someone who has an underlying, uh, some underlying conditions, never been on steroids, um, wondering if they're still at higher risk for COVID. So can you just retouch on that again? Does lung, having lung issues put you at a higher risk of contracting the disease or just to put you at a higher risk of the symptoms you may experience once you, yeah. once you get it? Yeah, you know, you're not, you're not at a higher risk of catching the COVID-19 virus. Um, however, if you were to get it, as if you have underlying lung conditions, and if, of course that depends on the lung condition, it certainly does put you at a higher risk of developing complications, I mean, severe complications. So, um, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, how, how bad, if you will, the, your underlying condition is. But to, to, to say the least, it does not, it does put you at a higher risk of getting bad complications. Okay. Um, I have a question here that's not cancer related. I'll just throw it out to see what, what your thoughts might be. Um, but around COPD, and this may be one for, for one of your pulmonology colleagues, but do you have any thoughts on COPD and, and managing that condition, um, possibly with some of those proactive steps that folks can take? Right. You know, I will, um, I will refer to the, most of the management of COPD uh, to our pulmonary, the lung uh, specialists. However, in terms from a surgeon standpoint, uh, it did, again, it did, does depend on the type of um, COPD, but there are surgical conditions that a surgeon can go in and actually, basically COPD in, may involve areas of the lung that are no longer uh, exchanging oxygen. And that's how people get short of breath. There are conditions where patients may develop what's called blebs or bola, and basically, and those blebs occupy space within the chest. And there are conditions where the surgeon can go in and cut out some of those blebs or bola, and in essence, allow the remainder of the lung to be able to increase in volume, increase in size. And because now those non-exchange, non-gas exchange, um, blebs are no longer there, no, are, are no longer taking up space in your chest. It really de de very much uh, depends on the particular condition. So your pulmonologist will certainly be able to, uh, get, to let you know whether there is something that a potential surgeon may be able to, um, to help you with. Excellent. Well, as we come right up on the three o'clock hour, um, we've timed this very well. We are actually, we've answered all of the questions that have been posed. So on behalf of Inspira, I would like to once again, thank you, Dr. Shea, for the time that you've taken this afternoon for this very informative webinar. For the folks on the line, thank you very much for participating. I hope that you found this to be insightful. I hope you're encouraged by what we shared in terms of the, the actions that you can take. Um, we're here for you if you're ready to quit smoking. We're here for you if you need to get screened. Um, and Dr. Shea is certainly here for you as well if you need his services. Um, he is actively taking appointments and, and has offices at both the Vineland Cancer Center as well as the Mullica Hill Cancer Center should you have any, uh, any needs in that regard. So thank you again for your time today. We appreciate you joining us. Stay safe and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you.